So at this time, I'm actually we're gonna do something a little bit different. I'm gonna ask, could uh, Miss do what? Oh, I thought I heard someone say, Miss Debbie, could you could you come up for me, Miss Debbie Headley? We're just gonna. I just one this morning. We just need to celebrate Jesus and how good He is this morning. Amen. The Bible says we overcome him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of our testimony. And so if you would stand up here so they can, the live stream can catch. Um, Last week we were at lunch, her and um, myself and her husband, and I've known them for for many years since I was just uh, like five years old. Anyway, one thing I've loved about their family as we've watched and um, from different various states and everything like that is Debbie has worked in various fields. And um, one of the things that I love about Debbie is that Jesus is not something, uh, something. Jesus is not someone who's Lord just in the building. Jesus has been Lord of her life. And uh, I want you, if you could, there was a couple of stories you shared with me and maybe pick out. There's so many of them that you could share, but maybe your top to um, just about how God uses you on your work and in your work. Tell them kind of what you do with your work and then the couple times that you were telling me about the person that you got to share Jesus with. Good morning, everybody. My name is Deborah Headley. Uh, My husband and I were pastors in Yankton, South Dakota, and God brought us here. And I'm so excited because I love this man and his family. And when we moved here, God brought, I was in EMS, and God brought me into EMS here. And God has opened up the doors um, more than I ever thought that he would possibly do. And, you know, God puts us in a place where he's always with us. Am I right? No matter what. And, you know, yesterday I saw a cicada. And, you know, they have the little shell that's on them, and it comes off. So it's time for us a lot of times to take that shell off and live our life like, we're, like God wants us to. And while I'm on the ambulance, I see a lot of things. I see a lot of psych. I see a, a lot of just, um, just people that are just very, very sick. And the other day, I just transported a patient that was going home. It was her last ride. She was an elderly lady. Um, her family was there, and we are going to transport her to a place where she was going to live out the rest of her life. The woman is very emaciated. She's not really conscious. And God just put it on my heart to pray for her. And as she was in the back of the ambulance and during that transport, I just started praying with her and just sharing God with her. I still believe that people here, even though when they're not awake, I still believe they know who it is. And they still, she just got really peaceful as I was praying with her. And, and it just, it blesses me to be able to go ahead and outreach and minister to those that are in need. God put us on this planet for a reason, to live rightly before him. Sometimes we get so involved in our lives that we forget our purpose of what we're supposed to be doing. I had a psych patient. This is my favorite story. This lady we picked up at the hospital, and she was um, going through some very, a lot of mental issues. Um, So during the transport, she just out in the open. I try not to minister the gospel unless God opens the door for me because I don't want to step on anybody's toes. Well, God always opens the door for me. So during this transport, this lady, she goes, I had an experience. And I go, really? She says, yeah. She says, I was just in a room, and I felt the presence of God. I go, really? She says, yeah. She says, I just wish I could have that every day. I said, well, you know what? Guess what God can do? She says, what are you talking about? I said, you can have that every day. She says, what do you mean? I said, God can come into your life, and you can have that peace like you had today. And she goes, well, how do I do that? She says, you don't know what I've done in my past. And I said, you're right. I don't know what you've done in your past, but I do know what God does. He knows and that he loves you. I said, he loved you so much that he died on the cross for you. Do you understand that? She says, what do you mean, for me? I said, yeah, for you and for me and for her and for everyone. And I said, for that peace that you can have, I said, all you have to do is receive him into your life. And she says, well, what do I do? And I said, well, first of all, let's just repent of everything that we've done and ask God to come into your life. 
and live rightly before him. Today is a new day. Quit focusing on the past. Quit focusing on what you've done in the past. Let's focus on what you can do today. I said, today can be a brand new legacy. I always use this illustration as if I drew a line right here, and this is your past. All you have to do is step forward. And when you step forward and you're past that line, only way to go back is either to turn around and go back into it or just keep moving forward. And so we prayed. And that woman who was having, like, I mean, I'm talking some issues in the back of the ambulance, Spirit of God just came on her. She got very calm and got very relaxed, and she received Christ that day. So no matter where we're at, no matter whether it's in an ambulance, in a grocery store, alongside the road or whatever, wherever God leads you, be open to be able to minister God. I am just so excited that what God is doing in my life and in our family's life that I get to, a chance to share his love and his joy. Thank you, John. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Amen. Thank you, Miss Stevie. It's wild because it's almost on, uh, I don't know if it's, it's almost, for a while it was weekly. She would just come in with this joy and she works overtime and in that ambulance lifting up people. She was telling me this morning she does training. So she's always training new people. So she never has a consistent partner that knows all the ins and the outs. So the stress, the overwhelmingness. But when she puts her life in God's purpose, it brings peace brings a resurrection story to so many people's lives. And that's what happens when we live our life for Jesus. Following Jesus is the best. And uh, it's kind of, we're using the end of our sermon today for the beginning because we want to get this picture of what following Jesus is like. If you have your Bibles, would you open them up with me? We're going to be diving in to a, a new series, but we're going to be looking at Luke. The, it'll be up on the screen for those that might not have something or just want to follow along. But we're going to be starting a series called Follow Me. Follow Me. Jesus' words to Peter, James, and John of Follow Me. And so to get a context of what we're going to be talking about, we're going to be reading Luke 5, 1 through 11. And we're going to be taking a look at this beginning when Peter, James, and John were first called to follow Jesus. Let's read. It says, on one occasion, while the crowd was pressing in, him, in on him to hear the word of God, he was standing by the lake, Gennesaret, and he saw two boats by the lake. But the, first, um, but the fishermen had gone out of them and were washing their nets. Getting into one of the boats, which was Simon's, he asked him to put out a little from the land. And he sat down and he taught the people from the boat. And when he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into the deep and let down your nets for a catch. And Simon answered, Master, we toiled all night and took nothing. But at your word, I will let down the nets. And when they had done this, they enclosed a large number of fish and their nets were breaking. They signaled to their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both boats so that they began to sink. But when Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. For he, had, he and all who were with him were astonished at the catch of fish that they had taken. And so also were James and John, sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. And Jesus said to Simon, Do not be afraid. From now on, you will be catching men. And when they had brought their boats to land, they left everything and followed him, followed Jesus. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the word this morning. God, may it be truth to our hearts. It is truth, but let it become the truth of our hearts. Holy Spirit, help us to understand what Jesus is saying. Holy Spirit, help us to see who Jesus is calling us to be. And we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Follow me. Peter, James, and John are in the boat. Jesus helps them catch these great amounts of fish, and then he invites them, follow me. 
for I will make you fishers of men, which we get from Matthew's gospel and Mark's gospel, even though they don't go into the totality of the story. Mark's gospel and Matthew quotes Jesus. He didn't just say for now on. He says, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. Fishers of men. One of the things that we recognize from this story as we look at the context of it is we're seeing a lot of things that are going on uh, without noticing it on what it means to follow Jesus, to follow Jesus. And so over the next several weeks, we're going to be looking at what it means, what it looks like, why, how, who, what does it mean to follow Jesus? And we want to answer these questions so that we can be better followers of Jesus Some of us maybe that have never entered into a relationship with Jesus. Maybe you're watching online. You've never understood what it meant to follow Jesus. We believe through this series we're going to be able to help you so that all of us can follow Jesus. But when Jesus asked Peter to follow him, the question is, what did that mean? What did it mean for Peter to follow Jesus. What did that mean when Jesus said, all of us have an idea of what that looks like? And for me, it boils down to three things. It boils down to following Jesus' teaching. That Jesus was gonna start teaching some things that were completely different than anything that they had heard before. He would start teaching them how to love their enemies. He would teach them how to honor God. He would start teaching them about the kingdom of God, that it wasn't about man, but it was about God. And as we looked at even last week, it's about living for God, not just in public, but even in the secret place. It was about a lifestyle. So it was about teaching. It was about a lifestyle. A lifestyle that was going to completely change this lifestyle that Peter had known his whole life of being a fisherman, a professional fisherman now was going to change. They now were going to live a lifestyle on the road. They were now going to live a lifestyle that required them to live differently in a different way. But most importantly, the third thing is the outcomes. Following Jesus meant that I am going to be about a different outcome than I've been about before. Outcomes of even if it cost me my life, that outcome is worth following Jesus. The outcome of of being on the road, I love the story right before Luke talks about Jesus going to his home church. It's really a synagogue and they invite him to get up and they invite him to speak. And in speaking, he says some scriptures and declares who he is and the town takes him out to a cliff to throw him off of a cliff. The outcomes of Jesus were not always pleasant to the natural eye. But Jesus was showing them following God is always worth it. Now, one of the things that we must recognize about this, for those of you that might be watching and you're wondering, I can't follow Jesus because of who I am. As Miss Debbie told the story about the person that said, you don't know what I've done. Here's the beauty about following Jesus is we hear Peter's words when Peter says, I am a sinner. He was basically saying, I'm unworthy. My life doesn't match up. My life does not, I shouldn't be able to follow you. I shouldn't even be in connection with you. I'm a sinner. He fell down at his knees, but Jesus repeated, follow me. Because the process, Jesus says, I'm going to make you into something. It's not about you becoming. It's about what I can make you to become. However, there was something about following Jesus that I think we might understand, but we need to see a little bit clearly, and that is this for Peter. It meant following Jesus even when there was a risk. Even when there was a risk. Here the story of of Jesus first calling Peter lets us in on some things that maybe we don't understand because we've followed Jesus for some time. But I want you to think about who Peter was at this moment. Peter was a man who owned a business and he had business partners. And the scripture says that they were washing their nets. They were washing their nets. That lets us know that these fishermen were done for the day. 
They were washing their nets of all the debris because if the net has a rock in it and it gets friction, it could tear the net. And if the net is torn, it can't catch fish and their money is made by the fish they catch. So the net is something that is needed. They're cleansing their nets. They're washing it of all the dirt, of all the debris. They're getting it ready because as Peter said, we've fished all night. Oftentimes they would fish in the night. It was safer, but it was also more prosperous to fish in the middle of the night, depending on the moon. And so it wasn't uncommon for people to fish at night. And so they would have to prepare their net and have it ready for the next day. But here Peter is, it's letting us know it's the end of the day. James and John, they've worked all night and they've caught nothing. He's got to go home for dinner. And when mama asks him, what did you make today? Where's the bacon? He has to say, no bacon here. No money. This is what they lived on. So a rough night, a rough day, worked all day, all night. He's ready to go home and kick up his feet. And I don't know if they had football back in those days, but I know men well enough. He had something he did when he went home. Time with his wife, time with his his family, a hobby. Something was to be done. He's ready to go home. And here Jesus is at the end of the day asking him to borrow his boat. Now this boat is how he makes money, so if they go out and something happens to the boat, there's a risk. There's a risk in letting Jesus use his boat because this is his business. It's costly. Right away, Peter recognizes it costs something to follow Jesus. It costs something. It costs whatever he requires. We also see that it's risky in following Jesus because of the amount of time it was going to take. He's taking time away from his family. He's taking time away from his rest. He's taking all of this time that he had previously used in certain ways, but now he's giving it up to follow Jesus. But something we don't read here in the text that we would read in the chapter before is another risk of following Jesus is, and we will see this through Peter's life, is Peter is going to have to risk his reputation. See, Peter was a fisherman, possibly accepted in society by his family, but just a few scriptures earlier, Jesus is being kicked out of his own home church. Jesus is not known as now someone to be accepted, even with the miracles and the power and showing his authority. Jesus is rejected. And we will find this as we follow Peter's life. We will continually see how Peter, James, and John following Jesus is going to cost them their reputation. Following Jesus' teachings, following Jesus' lifestyle, following Jesus' outcomes, man, it's risky. And following Jesus does not mean following him when his teachings make sense. Following Jesus doesn't mean following his lifestyle when it works out for my good pleasure. Following Jesus is not about my outcome and what I get out of it in the essence of the fame, the fortune. Following Jesus, Peter would learn, is all about Jesus. It's all about Jesus. Following Jesus. So the question that that leads us to is what we want to answer today. And that's, why then should I follow Jesus? Why should I? That's what people are asking today. I hear it on a regular basis with people. Why why follow Jesus? People are hypocrites. And they've got all these reasons to why following Jesus. They don't understand his teachings. How could Jesus teach this? I thought God loved everybody. How could God require this of a lifestyle of me? Doesn't he want me to have what I want when I want? How could I follow Jesus? Because the outcomes, Pastor John, when I look at your life, it seems like you have to give up so much. And I think I would answer them, and I do answer them, with the same thing that I believe Peter would answer them. Because following Jesus, like Peter, you'll discover, you'll become someone 
you could not become on your own. Following Jesus allows me to become someone that there is no way humanly possible I could become on even my best day. Following Jesus is worth the risk. Following Jesus is worth the time. Following Jesus is worth the outcomes. Following Jesus is worth the loss of reputation. Following Jesus is worth it. Why is it worth it? Because of who I become. Not what I become, but who I become from following Jesus. Peter sees this ultimately right away in Luke 5, 4 through 6. And when he had finished speaking, Jesus said to Simon, Put out into the deep and let down your nets for a catch. And Simon answered, I don't know if you know this, but I'm a professional. I've fished these waters my whole life. My grandfather fought a man for us to fish in this place. This is what we do with our life. Jesus, I know you're Lord, but I kind of know what's best for me. Jesus, I know that your ways say to do this, but I've done this enough to know what's best for me and myself. I wonder if some of us have said the same things when Jesus asked us to do something that went against the grain. But Peter recognized, Master, we toiled all night and took nothing, but at your word, and you've got authority. You've got authority over the, the demons that were with that man. You've got authority. You healed my mother-in-law. You've got authority. So what I'm going to do, Jesus, I'm going to trust you at your word. And when they had done this, they enclosed a large number of fish and their nets were breaking. Peter recognized right away, following Jesus, it may be crazy. It may cost me something. I may not always understand it, but it is worth the risk. It's worth the risk. Let's look at something else that we understand about Peter. There's just kind of three things that I look when I look at Peter's life and I look at who he ended up becoming after following Jesus. We can see this at the end of his life. We see it on the day of Pentecost when he stood up in front of people that he should have been embarrassed because he denied Jesus three times. We see this courage arise in Peter to stand up on the day of Pentecost and give a message to doubters and haters and see 3,000 people come to know Jesus. We see courage in Peter as he traveled throughout the known kingdom of Israel and brought Jesus to the known and to the unknown. We see this courage. We see courage even in his death as history records that Jesus was dying or Jesus, Peter was to be crucified on a cross and he said, stop I am unworthy to die as my savior. And so what did they do? They crucified Peter upside down and burned him. We see this courage that Peter was able to have that he couldn't have on his own. But we also see a humility. His last letter to the church. His last letter to the church. This is what 1 Peter or 2 Peter 1:14 through 15 says the end of Peter's life. Since I know that the putting off of my body will soon be, I'm going to die soon, as our Lord Jesus Christ made clear to me, and I will make every effort so that after my departure, you may be able at any time to recall these things. This is what Peter was talking about. He's making this ultimate statement saying, I'm going to die soon, but here is what I've learned here is what I've come to know about following Jesus that I want to make sure you never forget. And we see in 2 Peter 1, 5 through 8. It says, this is, for this reason, this is Peter speaking, make every effort to supplement your faith with virtue. The word virtue could also mean excellence. And excellence or virtue with knowledge. And knowledge with self-control. And self-control with steadfastness or faithfulness. And steadfastness with what? Godliness. See, I want to leave this up for a second. This is what Peter, at the end of his life, recognized was the most important thing to help people understand. 
I want to make sure after my departure, you do not forget this. And he even goes on to say, so for the rest of my days, the idea is, so what I will always do is I will always put you in remembrance of becoming these things. Because following Jesus, this is what your life will become. I was reminded of a story as I looked at these of a friend in college. And uh, it was his junior year. I wasn't attending a college at that time, but we were friends. And it was his junior year. And he had given up dating because it just felt like that he didn't want to get in the dating cycle. He wanted to wait till he was ready to be married. And so it was his junior year. I think it was the summer of his junior year. And he was at home thinking about, I think this is the season that I want to enter into the dating, the dating realm. Like I feel like, but I don't want to just date anybody. I want to be serious because I ultimately feel like I want to get married. I want to find a wife. And so as he went home and he was at home and with his parents before coming back his senior year, he wrote down the top 10 things he wanted in a woman. He got detailed, super detailed. And he thought, oh, yeah, if I had a woman like this, Proverbs 31 is all mine. He made lists like where they were from. Just different. And all of a sudden he began, he said, as he looked at the list to realize, what if they're horrible people? What if they're a horrible person? He thought nothing about character traits. He thought everything about looks and, and, and history and what they would be into and all those, those things are important. He began to realize. And so he started making character traits of faithful. You know, that they, they take care of things that came up with these, these different. I can't remember the exact words, but I remember as he was basically was sharing. Now, I don't know about you, but if I read this list, would anyone agree that this would make a really good friend? Man, if they were excellent, if they were full of faith, man, if they had knowledge of God and they, had, they were knowledgeable about things and when they ran into obstacles, they, they went to seek knowledge, they went to seek God, they got God's wisdom on the situation. How about self-control? Someone who knows how to hold their tongue and someone who knows how to in, in use self-control, especially when they're, we're in the middle of a, a nice conversation. And steadfastness. Man, they stick it out. They're out for the, the long haul. They're not up one minute, down the next. They're steadfast. They, they continue. Oh, and then some godliness. I don't know about you, but that's what I look for in friends. That's what I look for. That's what I look for in a, in a, in a mate. These would be things that would ensure that things would be good. My friend, as he looked at the, his list, and he was getting ready to pray, God, I'm going to ask you to help me find. He said, the Holy Spirit began to remind him that you only attract who you are. And as he looked into the list, he realized out of the 10 things he wrote down, he thought he was really good of about three to four of them. His list changed real quick. And he began to realize, I'm not going to lower my standards I'm going to have to upgrade my personal discipline to become the person I'm requiring someone else to become. Why? Because when we look at these traits, the fruits of the Spirit, the fruit of following Jesus, I don't know about you, but following Jesus, Peter recognized who I become is worth the risk. Following Jesus is worth it. Because of who I become, there's no way I could become this on my own. As we talked about Jesus, or Peter's death, he was able to take on death just like Jesus. Why? Because of who he become. When I think about Peter being crucified at the end of his life upside down, I think about the same Peter that asked Jesus if he should pull his sword. I think about the same Peter that denied Christ three times. I think about the same Peter that fell asleep on Jesus three times in the garden. I think about who Peter was. And then I read this and I think about who Peter become. Became. Following Jesus is worth it because of who 
we become. How many of you would say that if following, you've been following Jesus, how many of you can say that I've become something that there is no way, if you would have asked me before following Jesus what I thought my life could amount to, how many of you would say I've become something there's no way I could have become just on my own? Anybody testify and just say, man, I, Jesus has helped me become someone I never could have thought and or imagined I could have become. Following Jesus. Now, so we see the beginning of, of Peter's life, a fisherman feeling unworthy. And we see Peter at the end of his life trying to talk about the characteristics of God. He's found a place as a leader in the church. What was the process how did he do this? How do I become someone that, that how do, what, what does Jesus use? Do I just show up to church? Do I just, just read my, what do I do? I always look at this. This is what was interesting to me when I kept looking at the life of Peter and I kept looking what Peter did. This is what I find in Peter's life. I find that Jesus' teachings and Jesus' lifestyle and Jesus' outcomes, that Peter never was asked to do it alone. Let's look at Luke 5.11. Luke 5.11, when Jesus asked him to follow them, he says, and when they had brought their boats to land, they left everything. Peter never followed Jesus alone. Peter never was asked to follow Jesus alone. Peter never was required to try to do it all by himself. At the end of his earthly ministry, Jesus is getting ready to go to the cross. And Jesus is having an an end end of the year meeting, if you would. He's basically getting ready to say, I'm getting ready to go. And some things are going to happen. And in telling them what's going to happen, in Luke 22, 31 through 34, Jesus tells Peter in front of everybody what Peter will do. Listen to what he says. Simon, Simon, this is Jesus speaking. Behold, Satan demanded to have you that he might sift you like wheat. But I have prayed for you that your faith may not, what? Fail. I prayed that you won't fail. Jesus prayed that. How many of you know Peter still denied Jesus three times? So is failure missing the mark? No, he goes on to explain And when you have turned again, strengthen your brothers. Following Jesus does not ensure that we won't, that we're going to make it all the time. Following Jesus is not about being perfect. It's about being purified. Following Jesus is not about getting to this life where you can look at your life and I got it together. Nobody else does, but I do because I follow Jesus. You will mistaken uh, following what following Jesus is all about. Following Jesus is not about being perfect. It's about being purified. It's about getting close to Jesus and letting Jesus, his character, his traits become your character, your traits. But listen to what he says. Turn Again, to what? Your brothers. Why would Jesus ask Peter to return again to his brothers? Brothers, this is what one commentary wrote about. He says, Luke tells us in the beginning of his gospel that he's going to write a more detailed account because he read Mark's account and he read Matthew's account and says, That wasn't good enough. It's not detailed enough. And one of the details that they always leave out is a lot of the full interactions that Jesus had with Peter. John writes in his gospel at the end that when they were going to find Jesus, John lets everyone know, and the one, he didn't mention himself, and the one Jesus loved the most outran Peter. These dudes did not get along all the time. They did not always see eye to eye. Peter's like, the fish was this big. And Matthew's like, mm, let me use my uh, calculating skills. Actually, it was about 12.2 inches. You said it was 24. Again, Peter. You know, like, I'm just imagining the conversations that, that went on. Peter's like, we raised 30 from the dead. And Matthew's like, no, I'm looking at my records here because I'm a good record keeper. And it looks like it was only 12.7. 0.7? How did only 0.7? Well, in my calculations, when I divide, and Peter and Matthew are probably, Peter's like, just shut up with the details. And Matthew's like, the details are important. Luke, a physician, working with patients and 
listening to everything that went on, dissecting the problem to find out to give the right medication or to give the right outcome, would have understood, I got to dissect this, and I believe that's what he's doing with Peter here in Luke 5 to let us understand that Peter, no matter when it was, and we read it in Acts, you will never find Peter doing ministry alone. Why? Because Jesus lets him know and lets us know that becoming who Jesus calls us to become is not done alone. It's done in a group, a family, a community, whatever name you want to call it. It is done in a group. The process Jesus used to help Peter go from someone who says, I'm unworthy, I don't even deserve to be with you, to someone who's standing up and preaching and declaring the truth of God's word. How did he become that? Jesus put him in a group, put him in a group that were all about Jesus' teachings, Jesus' lifestyle, and Jesus' outcomes. And they all had to understand it will be costly, It will cost us our time. It will cost us our finances. It will cost us even our family. It'll cost us our reputation. It will be risky, but it is worth the risk. And I believe that's why God wants us to be in community, wants us to be with people, wants us to be in a group because we cannot do it alone. Why? Because of the cost it requires. In Hebrews 10, 24, It says this, and let us consider how to stir one another up to love and good works. Let us consider how to stir up one another. We need stirred up because it costs so much to follow Jesus. It's not impossible, but it will require us to lay our pride down. It will require us to lay things in our culture down. It'll require the time and the energy away from things that everyone else seems to get so much glory and so much fame from. It will require us to walk through seasons where actually in all reality, we may just even be alone. That's why it's important to have a group of people. And when I say group, it doesn't always mean just a local church. I'm talking about at your workplace. Imagine going to work. And you're just not sure if you got the energy to follow Jesus. And Debbie walks up to you and starts leading people in the back of an ambulance that are on the way in their COVID trials, on the way to die at a hospital. And she says, hold on, we're going to pray and we're going to help them find you. I don't want to do that right now. All I want to do is get away from this patient so I don't catch what they have. How many of you know if you had a Debbie in your life, man, things would be really good. What about when you go home and you're trying to be a mother or a father and you want to raise your children in a godly way, in the ways of Scripture? I will just warn you, for those of you that have not done that yet and that one day you will want to do that, I will tell you it will cost you your reputation. You will be called names. People will think you're better than them. They'll think you're a bigot. They will think that you just think that their kid is the worst kid on the block and that you're just an overprotective parent, but you in reality are trying to help them understand that following Jesus cost us something, but the cost is risky, but it is worth it. And as a father and a mother, you will need someone to encourage you to pray with you, to continue to believe with you the outcomes that Jesus promised because your kids will not always look like they are following the way and the fear and the worry and the insecurity will arise and you will need someone to look you in the eye and remind you, we can do this. We got this. Starting a business Going back to school, being in school, trying to finish your degree, doing it in a way, and you know that there's another way that you can do it. There's people you could pay to do it. There's shortcuts that you can take on your taxes, and there's lies. And you wouldn't call them lies because culture just says that's the way it is. But you want to be a person of character. You want to be a person of integrity. It will cost you because you'll have to do it the right way. And the right way is never the shortest way. 
And following Jesus will cost us something. Praying and loving your neighbor, believing and being around people who vote differently than you, believe differently than you, so you can be a light, so you could be connectors, so you could be the love of Jesus. It will cost you something. But let me just remind you, in the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, it is more blessed to give than it is to receive. It's more blessed to give my life to Jesus. It's more blessed to be about the things of Jesus. It's more blessed, why? Because who I become after following Jesus is something I could never do on my own. Those of you that have ever been on a mission trip would understand this, the food you eat, the culture you're around. As a seventh grade kid, I never thought I would be in a place with no air conditioning, eating food that I'm like trying to be the bird and, and it just won't go down. And they told me, if you don't eat their food, you'll offend them. And I'm like so scared to offend them, but I, I can't eat the food and the diarrhea it gives me. I just can't do it anymore. Taking a shower, there's 50 people and we're all sharing a cold shower and washing our clothes and, in water. And I've never even washed my clothes in a washing machine. Now I got to scrub them. Using two toilets for these 50 people where half of us have been eating the wrong stuff. Oh my gosh, we got to go now to a, a, a place where they told us there's guerrilla warfare. And people are walking around with machine guns just to deliver Coca-Cola. Thinking, what are they going to do to us? But I'll never forget the look in that kid's eyes when those kids would look at me after accepting Jesus. Never forget the look that they would give me. I couldn't speak the same language. I'll never forget the sacrifice that it cost us, the money we raised, the things it required. I will tell you to this day, I am better because of that moment. Following Jesus is worth it. So my question to us as we leave this place today is who in your life pushes you to be more like Jesus? Who do you have in your life? Who do you have challenging you? Who do you have looking you in the eye to encourage you, to correct you? That's a very not good statement in these day and age, and that's the word correction. But God knows we all need someone to correct us, as it says in Proverbs, that wounds of a friend can be trusted. Some of us, we need someone to look us in the eye and remind us, we got to be reminded, bro, we are about Jesus. Our lives are for Jesus. Like Miss Debbie said, our life is to be in reflection, to live for the glory of our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. The degree that I earn will one day open doors. And I can't forget, it's not just to make money for my family. It is to live a life on purpose in the expression of the glory of God. My family is not just something I hang on a wall in the essence of I look at them and I have a, a, an abundance of joy. It's people that I look at that I realize it is my job to shepherd them and help them to understand who Jesus is and why following him is worth it. It is up to them at the end of the day for them to choose it, but they cannot fully choose it if I have, fully, if I have not fully made it known to them. Following Jesus is worth it because I become someone I could not become alone. So who do I have? What group do I have that challenges me in the way that I live? Who do I look at my job and they exemplify love, joy, and Jesus? Who do I have that I can look at? And here's my last question when it comes to who's in your life. Why do I push them away? Why do I not draw closer to them like Peter did to Jesus? Why do I not say I need help? Why do I not say I see that you've run a race pretty far? I, I need to find out what did you do in this moment? I need people in my life that pushes me to be more like Jesus because becoming courageous and being humble and being like Jesus is not something I can do alone. Yes, I'm going to follow Jesus, but the places that I see Jesus asking Peter to follow him 
always took place with a group. I don't know about you, but I'm reminded today, and as I've studied this sermon, I'm seeing areas of my life that have slowly stopped following Jesus. Not run from Jesus, but somehow during the following, like Peter, I got tired and I fell asleep. Like Peter, insecurities, people's opinions, people's personalities, my past, different things have caused me to want to deny the reality of who Jesus is in my life. Now, you can judge me or you can join me. Judging me won't get you any far because we've all got areas that we do it because we're human and that's why we need a group. I'm praying through this series that we, in our hearts again, will say yes to following Jesus. No matter the cost, no matter the outcome, no, no matter the time that it takes. In this day and age, no matter the day and age, no matter the season of time, it is always worth following Jesus. Band, would you come? It is worth following Jesus. Several months ago, as they're coming, the band is coming, I was, I was burned out. Not in lot, just in some different things. I just was like, just having one of those, those moments of like, man, I'm just tired. I feel like I've been going. I feel like stuff's been happening. I called a friend of mine that has always been an encouragement and a challenge, a place of humbling myself. And I'll never forget what he said. He said, John, you need to ask God to call you again. I said, well, what do you mean? He said, Peter, after he fell, Jesus came to him and called him three times. Do you love me? Feed my sheep. Do you love me? Feed my sheep. Do you love me? Feed my sheep. Three different types of love because he was covering all the different areas of Peter's heart that had failed him. I think it would do us a really, really good thing this morning to answer the call of Jesus fresh and anew to say, I will follow you. I will follow you. Lord, I know the, I know the fire's been turned up in society. I know it's, could, maybe people are saying it's harder than ever. So I'm just going to turn my yes up a little higher. I'm going to turn my discipline up a little further. I'm going to get more people in my corner because following you is worth it. And I'm praying this morning, if you would bow your head with me, close your eyes, whether you're watching online, wherever you're sitting, if you would just ask yourself this question. The first question is, have you ever known that Jesus was asking you to follow him? Maybe you're watching this and you've never even heard of Jesus. You've heard of his love. Maybe you've heard about church, but this morning something in your heart has changed. You've recognized that there's something true about this Jesus. There's a desire inside of you that hasn't been there before, a desire to know this Jesus and to follow this Jesus. Right now, you can accept that. It doesn't have to be a desire. It starts out as a desire, but then my will says, yes, I want that to be true. As Miss Debbie shared in the beginning of our service about someone who just, they wanted that peace. They wanted that connection with God. It's just accepting Jesus. And right now you can do that. It's not some fancy prayer. Just say, Jesus, I accept you. I accept what you did for me. And I believe, I believe, I believe. The Bible tells us you're a child of God as you accept that free gift that God offers through Jesus. And we're so happy for you. We're so thankful for Jesus that he revealed himself to you this morning. We would love for you to email us at infofhtulsa.com just to tell us about what God's doing. 
how you accepted that. We'd love to partner with you. We're so thankful that you chose to do that. Maybe you're here this morning, though. You have accepted Jesus, but just even hearing this sermon this morning, there's something in your heart. You know, you know, you know areas that seem like they've fallen asleep. And this morning, you just need to recommit. Not recommit for salvation, but just for your own sake, saying, Jesus, I'm going to keep following you. I'm going to keep following you. No matter the risk, no matter the outcome, no matter how hard the teaching might be, following you is worth it. The outcome of following you is worth it. And you just have a conversation between you and God right now. As the band gets ready to sing this last song, we want this truth, this question, who in my life pushes me to be more like Jesus? Ask that question and ask the Lord to show you people that he has placed in your life. You don't sometimes even need the Lord. You already know. You see people and you see their fruit and ask, how do I make them more present in my life? As we sing this song to God, we're declaring, Jesus, we're going to follow you.